very much uh, for a wonderful introduction, Gary. And thank you, Amali, for staying on stage to have um, a fireside discussion uh, with me. Uh, it's an honor to be chatting with you and an honor uh, to follow uh, the previous chair, uh, Charlie Mercer. Uh, Charlie uh, is an old Cavendish school pal of mine. And the last time we were in the, this part of town uh, together uh, was when I was watching him arrive at his school prom uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, so it's lovely um, to be uh, reunited um, to discuss how we can turbocharge um, our local digital uh, economy and in particular looking at how we can uh, build tech into early stage uh, businesses. Um, and so we're going to discuss, I guess, a few key themes during the course uh, of the time that, that, that we've got now. Um, we'll start about uh, the tech itself uh, and what kind of tech we might go about building um, into uh, startups and scale-ups. Um, we'll pick up on some of the themes that we just discussed now on uh, the ecosystem um, and then we'll have a talk about skills. Uh, after that we'll have some time for some Q&A so please do um, start loading up your questions as we go along uh, because I will take them um, at the very end. So let's talk about the tech, uh, Amali. Um, what kind of tech might we be talking about building into startups? I mean, any of our businesses use technology, right? And this is the thing that we all now carry supercomputers around in our pockets. And what you can do for no money, little money, it's pretty incredible. Um, if you're thinking about, and you know, I'm, I'm, I know I'm talking to a lot of business owners here, I don't want to teach grannies how to suck eggs, but you know, when we think about kind of what types of technologies we might want to incorporate, there are so many different tools and services you can use, and it really comes down to just thinking, look, what is costing me time, costing me money, or what do I just hate doing, right? And how can you actually start building little bits of tools and technologies into this package in your business, which can just help you to do things quicker, faster, easier, cheaper, uh, and that side of things. Um, and the kind of things that we're talking about, I did make myself a list because I was sort of thinking, brain dump, you know, what did I use running businesses? Um, probably most of us are using definitely things like, you know, it might be Google or Teams, you know, keeping all your documents, all of those types of things you start with. Um, we obviously use lots of social media things. Many of us will have our website, uh, but also we have things like HR software, so being able to kind of just manage your people more easily, task management software, so things like Trello, Monday, Llama Life. How do you, again, just make your life a little bit easier and organize CRM systems? How do you keep track of who you're contacting, how you're contacting, email systems? Um, again, Monday, HubSpot, Zendesk, if you need to do marketing, customer services, your accounting software, um, your, uh, your pictures and marketing, so things like Canva, MailChimp, SurveyMonkey, um, and then lots of new AI tools. Um, and I don't know, I was having a little play around, and I know we've got some sessions on AI later on in the afternoon as well. But if you go into, for example, Microsoft Bing Search, they now have at the tab at the top, you know, you get things like, you know, search images, all of these types of things. They've got chat. And you can literally go in and, you know, chat with an AI there. I went in this morning and sort of asked it a question around, you know, help me build a basic CV. And it'll literally just kick out stuff for you. Um, and this is all free. It's online. Um, and it's just really easy ways for you to kind of just cut down the amount of time that you're spending doing something um, or to do it just better than you were doing it before. I can vouch for so many of those. I swear by monday.com. Yep. Absolutely love it. Um, there's a lot there, though. Yep. And, you know, to folks who uh, maybe haven't already kind of embarked on the journey of embedding some of those yep. into yep. Um, their businesses, it uh, could be a bit intimidating. Yep. You know, have you got to yep. be an expert coder? Uh, in order to do this kind of stuff? Where no. do you start? Um, you definitely don't need to be an expert coder. Uh, I used to teach people how to code, and I can literally, I could take anyone here and teach you how to build a really basic website in about 15 minutes, right? It, it really isn't that complicated. I don't think everyone needs to be a software developer. Goodness knows, and I've known a lot of devs. My husband is a dev as well. It would be a terrifying world if all of us were developers, as much <laughs> as I love developers. Um, however, I do think that there is benefit in just understanding the fundamentals. And I kind of liken it to you know, learning second languages. If you're, let's say, I don't know, visiting France, right? you don't need to be able to read Sartre in, in French. But 
if you can order a cup of coffee, if you can find out where your hotel is, if you can figure out how to go left and right and navigate, it just helps you to navigate the landscape more easily and helps other people to connect with you. And I think it's the same thing when it comes to coding as well. If you are using all of these tools and services, and even if it's something like, you know, you have a basic website, you're running it on Squarespace or Wix or something like that, you can just tweak it, you can adjust it. Um, and even if you're getting someone else to do things for you, you then have a little bit more of the language to help you understand what you want to tell them to do, them to understand what you want from it. Um, so I would definitely encourage anyone to just go and do, you know, basic, you can do online coding courses for free, just to understand some of the basics of that. Uh, but also there are loads of online courses around things like, you know, using CRM systems, uh, you know, creating good marketing campaigns. Um, I sign up to, um, actually, there's an ADHD newsletter, uh, which kind of uh, helps you again with lots of tools and services to help you with your productivity. Um, so all of these things are available. And just start with something small, something which you have a problem with. If you're finding that you keep forgetting to call up your customers, you know, start with your CRM systems. If you find that um, people just don't know where to go to find information about when you're open or what types of services you offer, you know, start with your website. Um, so don't feel overwhelmed by trying to do all of it at once. Just start with whatever your kind of most recent problems are. That makes total sense. And as you say, there are platforms, whether it's, you know, General Assembly is really great as well in terms of uh, manuals. Fu uh, Future Learn uh, yeah. is another one. Um, there's also a great organization called 100 Days of uh, No Code um, that specialize in supporting people to use low-code or no-code uh, tools, many of yeah. which that, uh, yeah. you just mentioned, yeah. um, to help people yeah. kind of slot yeah. stuff together. And another organization actually called the Institute of Coding. So they're an umbrella organization where lots of other uh, education providers around coding and digital education basically run their courses and short courses, longer courses, so definitely go and check them out. You can just search for courses and find out which free ones are there, um, but there's lots on offer. That makes sense. So if you are uh, an entrepreneur, say you're a, a solo startupper, yeah. um, I once was, I wouldn't solo start up again, it was because of my control freakery and na naivety, uh, and I've learnt that lesson. Um, but if you are on your own, you can be super nimble, you can decide what tools you want to use, you can upskill quite quick. Uh, where it maybe becomes more difficult is if uh, you're further uh, down the line, you've got a team, um, and the team have different preferences, different backgrounds, different needs, um, and then you're looking at maybe trying to embed some tech, if you haven't already, into the business. Uh, and there are cultural things like that uh, and stuff like that to navigate. Um, you've worked for large organizations, Microsoft as an example. Um, how might a large organization that's represented here in the audience go about that you know, cultural shift uh, to embed new pieces of, of tech in their scale up? I mean, I, I think hopefully, it, it's probably nothing new, but you know, when you're thinking about change, you are just talking about good change management. It's taking people along that journey mm -hmm. with you. Um, you know, everyone to your point, you know, you'll have different preferences. As a company, you can't, you know, have five different CRM systems working. It just wouldn't make sense. Um, but how you actually engage with the key people who are using those platforms, how you then onboard all of the other people who might use it as they go through, how you signpost people about that change coming, how you allow preparation time, you know, all of that kind of comes into it. So this is kind of just really fundamental sort of change management stuff. Um, but it, it is a human management stuff. It's really not a technology sort of aspect. Um, the technology is only part of it. And I think this is one of the things where when we have conversations about tech, we kind of forget that technology only works as long as it works for the people who are using it. Um, and those people are kind of you know, invested in using that as well. Mm. And it's one thing to start using a piece of technology um, and to kind of learn how to apply it in the first instance. It's another thing to continue using it, to maintain it, to improve it. Um, and I'd be interested to hear if we transition to the ecosystem side of things. Um, what kind of ecosystems would you recommend folks tap into uh, to help them along that journey, not just starting to use technology, but to embed it over a longer period? I mean, we were talking actually on the earlier panel about this idea of community. Um, and I think this is where location-based hubs can be really helpful because you know if you're going, for example, and you know, going to an event or, or working out of a co-working space or even just going down there you know, once a week, once every two weeks to just work for a day and just, again, meet other people going on a similar type of entrepreneurial journey. 
Um, you can actually be learning from them, you can be sharing ideas, um, and that's where you kind of get that exposure and also where you learn from the people's challenges. You know, if someone's implemented a new marketing system, you know, what was that like? What challenges did they face? How did they kind of go about that? Um, and outside of the, 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 the in-person environments, obviously you have lots of online communities as well. Um, so things like, um, what is it? I know London and Partners, for example, have their Mayor's International Digital Business Program. We have programs which um, are from organizations like Tech UK. Um, so loads of organizations who have these community building, community gathering sort of events and platforms uh, where again, you can just be learning from each other and hearing from others going along that same journey as well. Um, and I think this is the thing, talking about sort of being a solo entrepreneur and I've been sort of solo head of sort of two or three businesses in a row now. It's a lonely journey, right? Mm. Um, and, and you may not always be able to sort of talk candidly to all of your teams. You know, there are certain things which are your burden as a business leader to bear, um, but you've got to be able to chat to someone about it. So I think finding other people who are in similar types of positions, going through similar types of journeys can be really helpful um, and just help you feel less isolated and also just help you to make better decisions uh, because you can then get feedback from them around what worked for them and what might, what, what might have been some of the challenges that they face as well. Mm. And from a, a local ecosystems uh, perspective, we've got you know, great organizations like the um, Eastbourne Chamber of Commerce, um, there's the Eastbourne Business Improvement District, uh, you've got uh, the local BNI uh, as well, uh, but you know, community spaces like uh, Foundry, The Works, uh, Cohub, co-working spaces as well that are supporting people on a day-to-day -day level, sometimes without them realizing it, um, to, to learn to upskill uh, and, and to mix. And, and just to kind of add to that, you know, there's never enough hours in the day, mm. right? And I always kind of remem remember the adage, which is, you know, you never have time, you make time. Um, and I think when you talk about things like, you know, joining communities, it's often the thing which, you know, you just put to the bottom of your pile, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm too busy tonight, I'm knackered, I've been done an all-nighter, I've kind of got, you know, a client meeting tomorrow I need to prep for. But I think just making sure that you take time for yourself as a business leader to just leave some of that work behind, to learn from others, to expand your brain, expand your experiences, um, can really just help to balance. And it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, why, why do business leaders not take holidays? It's a false economy not to, because you come back refreshed, energized, new ideas. Um, and I know certainly, and I say this as someone who I would say is a social introvert, so I'm a very sociable person, I do a lot of events, uh, but I like my time at home, and you know, give me, a, give me a book and a cup of tea, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy as Larry. Um, but I do make myself go out and make that effort as well because I know that when I often come out of it, I suddenly go, ah, oh, that was a really interesting conversation. And you're all doing this here. You know, we're all here having these shared experiences together. So I think just you know, making time for yourself as a, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, um, and thinking about sort of you know, how you connect using technology can be really helpful there as well. Yeah, being in spaces where you're nourished by other ideas and experiences yeah. is, is really important. Uh, and that can include stepping out of the, yes. you know, these systems and networks and going on holiday or something yes. and seeing an Take interesting... Take holidays, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Although I have a story of that, and you're absolutely right. I, I totally sympathise um, with that point. Well, I think your mic might have Is my mic, mic gone? Is it back? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, totally agree in terms of taking holiday. I had a bad experience, though, on, on this front. So I used to run... Uh, social enterprise smartphone repair uh, company up in London, um, staffed by ex-offenders. And uh, our model, knowing that 29% of people have a smashed smartphone screen, um, and knowing that three quarters of those people don't get their phone repaired because it's too inconvenient, you've got to send it away or you've got to go to the high street, we ran pop-up repair clinics in large workplaces uh, across London. So in Barclays headquarters and Lloyd's headquarters and the Ministry of Justice, US Embassy, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I struggled to take holiday for exactly the reasons you said, Amali. Um, however, I was convinced to do it. I went on a digital detox retreat the first week in March 2020. Did not check my phone at all. And I thought, oh no, you know, should I really do this? You know, is my business, you know, is something bad going to happen? Is business going to die? People said, no, it's absolutely ridiculous. Went on this trip, came back, and people were wearing masks. And there was no <laughs> toilet roll anywhere. Uh, and I checked my email inbox. And all these large workplaces uh, that were our, um, you know, our customers were saying, Josh, really sorry, uh, you can't come in anymore. We're closing our offices. 
uh, and they have still never been the same since. And I, my business died as a result. So take holiday, but take it with caution. <laughs> So let's move on then to skills. We've talked a little bit about how we might upskill uh, to use some of the pieces of, of tech, low-code or no-code tech that you've uh, discussed. We've spoken about ecosystems that we can use to, that, to gain those skills. But I particularly want to talk about how we can embed early stage tech uh, via skills in our, our young people, emerging uh, entrepreneurs. Yeah. This is something that you did a shed load of uh, yeah. at Code First Girls. Yeah. What's your take on how early should we be starting? As early as you can, honestly. And uh, look, I know and I've run programs to train young people. I, I sit as a trustee on Ada, at Ada College, which is a specialist digital college. Um, I'm the chair of a company called uh, Digital Camp, which focuses on running camps at, for, for young people. Um, and I've employed lots of graduates. I've interviewed, I've trained. It is work. Right? And I think no one here would deny, I'm sure, you know, when you're thinking about young people who don't have experiences coming through, that is a, that is a, a, a sort of a, 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 time, a time spent in your business where you think you might be able to do other things. But also, think back to your own experiences. And I think back to the work experiences that I had at the age of 15, at 16. These were fundamental building blocks of me being able to sit here today and have this conversation. Right. Mm. And when I look at you know, the impact of those interventions that I was able to make, those are things I'm most proud of. You know, when I think of actually, I think it really came home to me once when I was, um, so CodeFest Girls, we used to run free coding courses for young women. And I remember seeing a, a tweet or a, what is it called, an X? An I don't X know, now. is it still called an X? Yeah. Um, post. Post uh, from a young woman who was going to join for one of the CodeFest Girls courses. She was being taught volunteer teacher by another young woman who had done one of our courses about 18 months prior to that. And she had been taught by another young woman who had been taught about a year and a half before that. So three generations of individuals who, who were teaching each other how to navigate their way in tech. And I think going back to the conversation we had on the panel earlier, this idea of be, building ecosystems by hiring, by supporting, by helping to train young people in your businesses, you are creating your own staff, your own customers, your own colleagues kind of going forwards and, and helping to put in place those building blocks. Um, there are programs out there which can help. So obviously some of your businesses which are large enough will be paying into things like apprenticeship levies, really great way to actually be able to support young people through education. Um, there are also programs like the, and I think it's called the Santander, I, I used to call it Santander Internship Program. Mm. It's formally called the Santander University's Employability Scheme, which offers a thousand pounds for you to take on summer interns, right? So you offer match funding effectively. When I used to do this through Code First Girls, we used to do a top up to the London living wage, uh, but just to help you do that in a more sort of financially cost effective way. Um, but it really is a fantastic way to kind of, you know, give back into your local community, but also just to find amazing people. Um, I was chatting to actually one of my uh, a, a recruiter who I'm now a friend with. Um, he hired sort of, you know, a couple of young people who joined his recruitment company. Um, and they are now the foundation of his business. You know, they do incredible work for him and he's trained them. They are now loyal to him. They get, you know, support from him. Um, so I think, you know, being able to Im make that investment into young talent, I think is really critical. And as you say, you know, tech is almost like a language. Um, and... Uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, within the family, learning a, a language can be something that you know, almost happens by osmosis um, through just practicing it. Tech is exactly th the same kind of thing. Yep. And my, when I was working with ex-offenders and training them up um, to repair broken smartphone screens, I learned myself via YouTube and then passed myself off as, a, as an expert. Um, they were then training yep. their families yep. by just doing repairs uh, at home, uh, people getting interested and learning you know, some of the lingo. It's almost like operation to repair uh, a phone. Um, and uh, the kind of uh, sharing of those skills happened um, in a really fluid way once it became part of the kind of routine uh, in, in their lives. Um, but I'll, I'll go on. And, and I was just going to say, being able to you know, take advantage of some of those. So I remember mm. when I was at Code First Girls, and it was my, one of my junior associates, who was 20, who came in and ran our Instagram social media campaign. 
I didn't know how to do this. It wasn't really where I thought, you know, was, was a good place to spend my time. But this is another thing which, you know, young people can kind of be bringing into your business, which is just knowledge and skills about things that, you know, are relevant to them and their sort of communities, uh, which may or may not be of interest to you, so. Yeah, I, there was an example of that uh, on one of our programs. We trained up um, a, a cohort of young people um, in five days. It was an intensive boot camp. Um, and at the end of the boot camp, uh, one of them took a picture of their phone repair tools and put it on Snapchat. And within about nine minutes, had seven customers like ready and waiting to pay for these services. Um, so, I mean, it speaks to, you know, the kind of, versatility um, of their skills and the additional stuff that young people can bring um, by being part of, associated with um, a lot of our, our, our businesses. So we've spoken a little bit then about what uh, businesses can do uh, to help inculcate this culture of learning and upskilling. Uh, on the last panel, we started to have a discussion about the politics yes. and about government. Uh, I have plenty of views on this, I, but I this, be isn't, you for this, this, part, this, this isn't I this isn't a platform for me to to, to do that kind of stuff. So I'm going to hand the mic okay. to you. Right. What do you think uh, the government needs to be doing to embed um, tech skills in our young people so that they're essentially embedded in our entrepreneurs and our employees of the future? It does come down to education, right? And it comes down to making sure that we're funding our educators. It comes down to making sure that we offer alternative paths through education. Um, and I say this as someone who has ADHD, right? I was awful at exams. I was really good at coursework. You know, put me, put me in front of, uh, you know, a research environment. I will go into a deep, dark research hole for days, right? But I was awful with exams. It just wasn't the way that my brain works. Um, but you know, thinking about how we enable people to go through their educational experiences, the support we have, um, that makes a big difference. And, and to be fair, you know, there are lots of obviously things we need to improve on, but I, I do, I, I, I am reassured by the fact that we are now able to have more conversations than I had when I was you know, growing up in the 80s about neuro neurodiversity or different genders or senses of identity or you know, students who might just have different learning needs. You know, it, that has, you know, we have, as a society, we have evolved more um, mm. in that space. But there is still stuff to do, mm. right? And there are still a lot of young people and a lot of adults who just weren't served by our educational system. Um, and it's not just about young people as well. And I do think that, you know, thinking about the changing landscape, you know, all of us have to, you know, we, we talk a lot about this idea of lifelong learning. But it's true, right? We don't have, many of us don't have jobs unless you're running your own business. But if you're working for a company, you may not have a job for life, right? You may not even have an industry for life, right? The job that you had when, you know, when I think about the jobs that I had at the age of 20, you know, some of those jobs don't exist anymore, you know? Um, and the jobs that will be there in 20 years, maybe they don't exist right now. So how we are able to adapt to that, and especially with an aging population, thinking about sort of re-education and reskilling as we go through our lives is really critical. And I do think that this is somewhere where government really needs to make a proper investment, which is you know, thinking about how we continue to support people throughout their careers. Um, I, I, um, I was actually a, a commissioner on a, uh, an education commission up in Doncaster a number of years ago. And I got to see first hound, I think, there, and I, you know, I certainly don't see that in Eastbourne, but you know, at that time when I went, a, a community who felt abandoned from a, a skills and training standpoint. Mm. There were people who wanted to work and who just did not have the skills to do the jobs that were needed. And because of that, the companies who were able to hire moved out of there as well. So this is a thing which I think you know, all of us kind of need to care for. Um, and just com continue to support our politicians and ask them to kind of raise the bar around just making sure that we create great learning environments for lifelong learning as well. And it can be an incredible tool of engagement um, as well, taking, you know, uh, uh, memory from when I was working with, you know, ex-offenders in East London, many of the young people who we were working with, who we were upskilling, um, are folks who have been offered all sorts of other kinds of opportunities in other sectors, whether it was catering and hospitality, whether it was horticulture, construction. Uh, for many of them, they were interested and, you know, they worked. 
for others, they just weren't interested uh, in, in those kind of things um, and wanted a different way of being able to engage with the economy. The lack of those opportunities meant that they felt pushed, actually, in some ways, um, into, in, in, into crime's corner. Yeah. Um, and so we identified that in our patch of London, uh, the tech sector was booming, whether it was uh, in Old Street area uh, nearby, whether it was FinTech to the south of us in, uh, in Canary Wharf or to the north, uh, the Olympic Park, there's a, a robotics center uh, there. Um, and tech and tech skills were a great way of supporting um, folks who were hitherto marginalized to engage uh, in the economy and in society in a more positive way. Um, but we have three minutes left. Uh, and I promised that we would uh, take some questions um, from anyone um, who has something burning that they might have wanted to ask. So I'm going to start with, I think that's Paul Corney over there. Cool. So for anyone who couldn't hear, Paul has asked, reflecting on uh, our respective careers, what um, is our biggest regret, I guess? What mistake would we not make again? Yeah. There, there's something which I say often to especially the sort of young people that I work with, which is it's never too late and it's never too early. And I think that this is something that, you know, for a lot of us, especially when we're going into things that we haven't done before. It's very easy to kind of sit there and go, oh, I've, I've missed the boat for that. Or uh, not quite ready for that. I don't really feel I've got the experience yet and, you know, wait for it. And, you know, there are lots of hurdles out in life, right? But yourself shouldn't be one of them. And this is, I think, you know, and I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs. I've worked with and met a lot of really successful entrepreneurs. And the single thing that makes them different to others who might want the same thing. It's just that they just start, right? So don't let yourself be kind of held back by perceptions of, you know, what should be happening. Just get started. And it's an incredible how far you can actually get by just sort of cracking on with things and finding people who can kind of support you along the way as well. Um, so that would be kind of my mistake, which was, you know, I spent too many times kind of counting myself out of things, which I shouldn't have done. Um, and even things like, you know, we're having lots of conversations about AI, for example. I can imagine there are people here who are curious but sort of thinking, oh, I don't really know where to start with it. There's lots of stuff out there. Go to some of the panels which are happening later on. Call us some of the people and just get started. If you're curious and you think it might be helpful, you know. Yeah, I would totally agree that basically anything that can prepare you, anyone, for running a business is running a business itself. So just do it. In terms of a, a mistake, um, I um, learned a lesson a little while ago uh, just to not be afraid about asking for help. Um, I used to have a real problem with that and I used to try to do everything uh, myself. And I might get a bunch of those things done, um, but I uh, would have got them done far quicker and probably far more effectively had I uh, asked. Um, and you know, what I love about the startup community, actually, is that people really want to help. People are really flattered uh, to be asked uh, for advice. Uh, people want to provide uh, mentorship um, and to impart their, their expertise, but also on a personal level, uh, important to ask for help as well. When I was um, starting my organization, we basically weren't getting anywhere. Um, for you know the first six months, you know, I was going and knocking on the doors of these big corporates and saying, "Can I bring some ex-gang members in to come and repair your phones?" And getting lots of uh, doors slammed in my face, and it was like utterly um, uh, demotivating um, to be laughed out of, of rooms, uh, essentially. Um, and it had a you know negative impact on my mental health. Um, and one of the best things I did was start speaking to people about how I was feeling um, and, um, you know, sought, sought help, um, had therapy, was on antidepressants for, uh, for, for some time as well. Um, and there's absolutely no shame uh, in that. It got me to the place where I needed to be a great launch pad to have been able to do a bunch of the things that I have wanted uh, to do. Um, and that journey feels like it's only just getting started uh, for me. So 
uh, asking for help, absolutely. I won't make the mistake of uh, trying to do everything alone uh, again. Um, but I can see Gary out the corner of my eye uh, giving me evils, uh, <laughs> which I think means um, that our time uh, is up. So can we give Amali a massive round of applause for the insights that you've shared?